Welcome to Manifold. My guest today is Glenn Luke. Glenn has a very impressive background. He's worked in investment banking, private equity, and he's also been a company founder. I discovered Glenn through his uh, Twitter handle, and uh, he is a source of very insightful commentary and analysis about the Chinese economy, US-China competition, uh, and related topics. I always pay attention when someone with a real operating business background, and in his case, uh, a cultural background in the region, has something to say about China and uh, East Asia, because there's, as, as, as you may know from things I've said on previous podcasts, I feel like we're living in a rather unique era of propagandized uh, narrative about what is actually happening in that very important region of the world. So Glenn, I welcome you to the show. Hey, Steve, great, great to be on the show and thanks for having me. So um, let's start by talking about your background. I kind of gave a little bit of a hint of it, but uh, would love to hear uh, more about it from your perspective. You can go back as far as you want. Um, I understand you have part Taiwan, part Hong Kong heritage, which uh, actually I myself have as well. Maybe you could start there. Yeah, no, sounds good. Uh, so, you know, I think one of the sort of interesting things about my background is it's, it's a really, it's a real blend of Taiwan, Hong Kong, and mainland China background. And, you know, each of these influences have shaped the way that I've developed in my career as well, you know, personally and culturally. You know, I have a living connection to historical events through my parents, World War II, the Chinese Civil War, and it, it sparked an interest in me pretty early on that I might want to go to work uh, and, and live out in the region. Um, having grown up in suburban New Jersey for my whole life, I always wanted to live in the city and actually explore the world. Um, and so... You know, in college, I went to school in Philadelphia, uh, you know, in an urban environment. I studied uh, finance initially, but I also, you know, I was a, a technology, I was kind of a tech geek growing up. And I, I was one of those kids who was programming on their, their Apple II when they were nine or 10 years old. And so I also was, was interested in technology. Um, but actually, the, the Asia connection was also another interest area of mine. Um, and it's really interesting looking back when I when I think about how if you know macro events and, and external events sometimes shape your career. But you know, for me it was probably the dot com boom, because I was all set to head out to Silicon Valley in two thousand. And I had done a tech internship that summer and uh and then the, the bubble crashed. And so I I, I made a pivot. Uh, and you know, not Surprisingly, for a lot of my my classmates in my undergrad business school, investment banking was was one of the well trodden paths. And you know, I didn't, you know, I had this uh, inclination to not want to go down the, the really well trodden path. So for me, what made it a little bit different was exploring opportunities out in Asia. This was the winter of two thousand. It was three years after the two to three years after the Asian financial crisis. And it wasn't a well-trotted path at that time to, to go out to Asia. And I, I just uh, fortunately had an opportunity to, uh, through some friends of mine, uh, find some job opportunities out there and eventually interviewed. And, you know, that, that winter it really came down to uh, working for a, a, a boutique tech investment bank in the States and really out to work for Deutsche Bank in, in Asia. And so I, I ended up choosing to go out to Asia. Um, and, uh, and so I, I spent my, I spent three years out there. I, I, you know, met a lot of really interesting people. It was, it was a really fascinating time to be out there. Um, our, our clients at the time were mainly, I, I was mainly focused on mergers and acquisitions, which in Asia at the time was working a lot with the, uh, actually the state-owned enterprises in the oil and gas and power industries for not only for China, but for Japan and for Korea. And so it was, a, it was a really fascinating journey for me, you know, having grown up, you know, in the States my whole life to go out there and, and suddenly be sitting across the table from, uh, 
you know, CEOs that, you know, from, from backgrounds that are completely different from yours and, and just seeing how, how, how different things were. Was, there was definitely a big uh, culture shock and just a life shock for me. Can I ask you a question uh, had, about how, how yeah. so I've, I've had similar experience, but I'm curious what your experience was like. So for you as a, what's called an ABC or, or someone who grew up primarily in the United States, but is say of Chinese heritage, when you were meeting with, you know, real Chinese people, like someone who was leading a state-owned enterprise and had come up in maybe the communist system, uh, taken the Gaokao and maybe attended, uh, you know, one of the major Chinese universities. What, what was that like? Like, uh, was there an immediate affinity? Were there tensions? How, how did you get along with these folks? Well, one, I was, I was, I was relatively junior at that time. So I think the, you know, my, my interact, my direct inter interactions with, with, you know, the chairman or the CEO would be quite low, but I mean, I was even quite, you know, su surprised at how much of a cultural gap there was with people in Hong Kong uh, who could speak English. <laughs> so for me, it was actually a, just identity wise, actually affirming how American I really was by, by seeing how Asian uh, people out in Asia were and seeing how, how things were different. This was also Steve post 9-11. And it was, it was actually a bit of a shock to see how the rest of the world thought about the, the sort of issues that are talked about in, in, in a certain way in the States and the media and how seeing how they talk about it in the South China Morning Post or in, in other, you know, foreign publications. So that was a, that was a big shock for me as well, because you kind of grow up with a certain you know, impression, you know, you, know, you, you recite the, you know, you, you sing the national anthem, you sing, Amer you know, America the Beautiful, and all of a sudden you see a different side of the world. Uh, so for, for, for me, I think just going out there was really, really eye-opening. And, and so you were living in Hong Kong during this time, is that right? And that's right. Yeah. So I ended up, I ended up living three years out there. Uh, I, I, you know, it's, anybody who's done investment banking during the analyst year, it was it's a grind. Uh, but it was definitely a, you know, work hard, play hard, you know, building a really interesting network. You're, you're all sort of sitting in the trenches together uh, at the same place in life. Most people are single. And so you end up developing a really, really nice network out there, which I think has uh, grown up with me as, as, you know, I moved back to the States um, after three years, a lot of my network has um, either stayed in the region or actually, you know, dispersed in, in other parts of the region in Korea and Japan, mainland China. Um, et cetera. And I'm guessing if you traveled in China during that period and looked at Chinese companies, you, you saw a lot. I mean, you saw unfettered capitalism at work, maybe more, more, more capitalism than you could possibly appreciate. You could actually ever see in the United States or Western Europe. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I remember first, I think it was December 1st, 2001, which was the first time I actually crossed the border into China. And, you know, one of the things that first struck me was poverty. I just, I just never seen uh, that uh, level of poverty before coming out of the, the border, uh, you know, border control at, at Lowell uh, and seeing, you know, beggars on the street. And, but at the same time, it was juxtaposed next to this, as you, as you call it, this dynamism that was also very, very apparent. So, um, you know, our, at that time, you know, one of the, this was the time when Chinese uh, SOEs, which are most of our clients, were really venturing out into the world. So in doing m and for them, I mean, our value add, our, our role was to help them navigate this new world of foreign acquisitions. Um, so, you know, there were just really, really interesting stories that, uh, you know, I could talk about, but it was, it was a lot of it just had to do with culture clash and, and not understanding how, how business is done abroad. And part of our role as, as bankers was to, you know, guide them through this process. Do you think you could contrast what the, the, the current level of complexity is or sophistication among Chinese companies now versus what you saw 20 years ago? Yeah. I mean, I mean, 20 years ago, I mean, in the power sector, I would just dive into the power sector because we spent a lot of time there. Uh, this was early 2000s. Enron had just happened, but you know the, the late 90s uh, and the early 2000s uh, in the power sector was about deregulation. And actually, at that time, the Chinese were well. There was a couple of things going on. The Chinese were very uh, 
supply constraint on power. Um, so there's a lot of power shortages going on. They just, you know, they couldn't build power plants fast enough to meet rising demand. Um, when they imported uh, power equipment from from abroad, it was expensive relative to their level of development. And so they were definitely constrained on, 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 on the power side. And they're also very, very open uh, to, you know, Western style market reforms. Um, they had been already experimenting with uh, partial privatizations of some of the uh, power companies, the, the, the power producers uh, like, like Bono or, or Datang uh, in the 90s. Uh, and they were experimenting with true Western style power reform, including dividing the power grid into, you know, transmission and distribution and breaking it up and privatizing the, the grid as well. So I, I think one of the things we, we, we noticed was that post Enron, uh, some of the, they sort of, it was one of the first times where they kind of sat back and said, actually, maybe we should, we shouldn't move so quickly on some of that, that regulation. And so, um, yeah, but this was still, this was still a time in general where I think there was a lot of openness um, and there was a lot of, I would say, looking up to the West as a model for, for development. And I think that's, that's sort of changed over time as the, the Chinese companies themselves have gotten more sophisticated and, and, and learned on their own, learned by doing, um, and kind of felt their way across that, that river um, of, of development. One of the things I, I emphasize in my tweets or when I talk about human capital or the fertility problem in China is that people with experience uh, with China back 20 years ago would realize that the edu average education level was very low. So the a whole, whole generation had basically kind of missed college because of the Cultural Revolution. And um, even for a kid graduating high school in around 2000, maybe only a few percent, maybe 6% at most would get to go to college. And so most people just didn't have that much education. And whereas now, of course, the college going rate is similar to the United States and people are about twice as likely to do STEM subjects there as they are today. So I think if you didn't live through that, you wouldn't really appreciate drastic change in the average level of human capital for people that are young and entering the job market in China. Yeah, no, no, I, I agree with that. I think, I think you've seen this, uh, you know, explosion in, in sort of the college enrollment rates, uh, starting really in the early 2000s, but really starting to ramp up in the uh, 12 to 13 years ago. And, uh, and today you're, you're just seeing a net influx of, you know, plus 10 to 11 million college graduates. And this includes vocational schools as well. Um, but 10 to 11 million, uh, college or vocational level graduates in, you know, entering the workforce. And, you know, and one of the things I do talk about in my, in some of my tweets is this theme of how structural change in China is actually underpinned by this demographic change. So this, you know, you know, when I was there, it was really about the blue collar workforce. Um, you had, uh, you had the biggest, uh, generation, the biggest cohort was actually, I think, 1985 or 1986, and 95% or more of them never went to college. So they were effectively blue collar. And, and these are the folks that were really building the country and, and developing the country in the, in the 2000s, first with the export-oriented uh, manufacturing boom, then post-GFC, the switch over to property and, and infrastructure. Um, and now, as as you have this rising and growing labor pool of college educated workers, now you're seeing, not surprisingly, the the rise of companies like BYD, which are hiring tens of thousands of PhDs and masters and and, and undergrad college graduates, um, and really switching their model from this old, you know, construction and concrete intensive asset intensive model into really an IP technology and manufacturing or advanced manufacturing model. Yeah, you're hitting on, you're hitting on, I think, one of the main uh, conceptual things that people who are watching China from the West are missing. We, we should maybe put a bookmark there and come back to it because I want to yeah. finish with your bio before we get in. That's a pretty meaty topic for us to discuss this, this pivot from property and infrastructure driven economy to really advanced manufacturing and technology driven economy. Um, Let's talk about how you got into investment, that went from investment banking to private equity and venture. How did that happen? Yeah. So, you know, it was really interesting. I, I, I spent, you know, I think at the, 
by my by the end of my second year, I was already feeling a little bit a little bit homesick. Um, and I also start to realize, and this this illustrates some of the shift that was going on in, in Asia at the time. Uh, when I when I joined uh, as as a 22 year old analyst, my my the head of my group was an Australian expatriate uh, who had done project finance throughout the region in the 90s. And you know, just if you think about you know where investment banking, where the where the where the fees were going, it was it was going to China. And so, as I mentioned before, we're, we're, you know, we have to pitch business, we have to win mandates and, and work with national, you know, state-owned enterprises. And so we're dealing with Chinese people. And so you'd have this situation where, uh, you know, actually our role was to really draft the, the, the content of the, the, the documents. And we would actually send the documents. This, this is actually another interesting thing. We would send the documents up to our Beijing office. And our, our Beijing office were... Uh, you know, graduates, the, the, the top graduates from the top universities in China, like Beida and Tsinghua, and they were, their their job at the time was as glorified translators. They would take the, the sort of energy and power content that we, we had drafted in Hong Kong, and they would translate them, and then we would pitch, you know, these these mainland Chinese executives through a translator. And, you know, investment banking is is a relationship business, and it was it was not tenable. So uh, by my the end of my second year, we actually ended up hiring um, a fairly young uh, mainland Chinese uh, director. I promoted him. Um, and he was one of the first wave of what? mainland Chinese who had actually left China in the, in the early 90s mm -hmm. and gotten their finance training uh, out in the West. In, this, in his case, it was at Rothschilds in, in London. And, uh, and, and this was the archetype of the... Uh, the type of investment banker who had both the cultural affinity as well as the, the specific technical skill set to be able to win business. And we started, we also hired a, a lot of other mainland Chinese uh, executives from other banks, and we started building a real business out there. But to me, it, it sort of signaled a couple of things personally. One was, I kind of alluded to earlier, I, I, I felt like even in Hong Kong, it was not a perfect cultural fit. And when you started seeing where the the banking industry was going, it was going towards mainland China. It was it was an even bigger leap, and so um, you know, having grown up in the states, you know, my you know, I had language skills, but you know, uh, I didn't have a a network. Um, you know, just it would be it would be a struggle to to develop myself out there as sort of a mid career, mid level professional in the investment banking industry. The other the other reason, Steve, that I I left was I was a little bit sick and tired of doing mostly oil and gas and power. I, you know, I, I, was a, I was a tech guy. And so I was like, okay, I, I want to sort of develop that, that aspect of me as well. So uh, in 2004, I ended up moving back to New York uh, and I pursued that. I, I ended up getting a job with InvestCorp, uh, which was a, a Bahrain-based private equity firm. And, and I, specifically, I, I joined the technology investments group over there, which was a, it was a good fit. It was a, it was a relatively large firm, but this was a, a unique, we had our own, um, we had our own fund structure uh, and it was a relatively autonomous group within a larger, uh, you know, private equity firm. And, and, and we focused on technology and uh, it, it really started with late stage venture capital. Uh, and then we, we shifted more towards a control oriented uh, private equity model, uh, which I can talk about as well. But I think what was this, this was really interesting for me because I think in the when you're, you know, on the what they call the sell side, which is investment banking, uh, you're really advising other companies, and and you have a little bit less at stake. I think what was wonderful about investing is that you're you got to put your money where your mouth is, so you have to be right. Um, that's the most important thing. It's about being rational and uh, being a rational investor. Um, you know, this was also the time where I started, you know, have you know, starting to invest in the stock market, and you know, I discovered. Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger and Berkshire Hathaway, uh, and just really gravitated towards their investing model, but really their their this this theme of continuous lifelong learning building. I think Munger, the late Munger, calls it called it the last work of mental models for investing in life, um, and that really dovetailed with the professional training I was getting at you know in, in the private equity industry where you, know, you learn how to do due, due diligence, you learn how to build. Uh, mental frameworks and investing frameworks, you 
deepen your expo exposure into multiple industries and sectors. Um, uh, you know, within the technology space, I, you know, I started out uh, looking at semiconductors and uh, telecom equipment and later moved on and uh, into enterprise software and digital marketing and, and security. Um, but I, I think that the, the real takeaway for me from this was uh, this idea that it, it's, you know, it, to be a good investor, uh, you really have to be rational and you, you have to, you know, get things right. And that's the most important thing. And I think this, this does touch on some of the things that we're, we'll talk about later with, with China and, and try to figure out what's actually going on out there if, if you're point is to get things right. Yep. You know, I, I, I knew Charlie Munger a little bit when he was still alive and uh, he had a connection to Caltech and um, he liked to meet scientists. And so I attended a few dinners uh, with him. He was already quite old, but still mentally sharp. And one of the things about him is I was like starstruck, you know, when I met him and I was like, wow, it's a great honor to meet you, Charlie. And, and he was like, no, Steve, the honor is all mine. And he was so humble. Uh, he really admired yeah. what the scientists did. And he used to just say like, hey, what Warren and I do is really just common sense. And, but, you know, of course, we all realize not very many people can do it, actually. Most people will deviate in some way from, even if they understand the principles that uh, Buffett and Munger use, they can't really implement them. So um, just just a really unusual guy, I think, um, very smart. I mean, I mean, you know, he was self-deprecating, but fundamentally, I think he was actually, uh, actually, very, very high. G. Yeah. If, if anything, like I'm, I'm more of a Munger than a than a Buffett fan. I, I just think his approach to, you know, learning, and being multidisciplinary. Yep. And, and I, I think Buffett talked about him in his eulogy, in his last letter about how much of an influence he had on on building Berkshire Hathaway and really changing it from that sort of cigar butt you know, buy something for a dollar for 30 cents to really building value over the long term by, by compounding and by growing instead of yeah. you know, just looking for deals. Their, their view into China was largely influenced by an investor called Li Lu from Himalaya Capital. And some of the, some of the dinners I went to were at Li Lu's house. He, all, they all lived near Munger and Li Lu lived kind of near the Caltech campus. And, um, uh, so yeah, so I think Munger, um, was had a little bit more of like a vision visionary was willing to be like a little bit of a visionary about the future rather I think more much more so than Buffett. Yeah. So that experience as a invest as an you know someone who actually invested in public companies or large companies that are almost public companies, I'm sure that also helped you when you eventually became a founder of a company. So maybe maybe you could talk about that. Yeah. So um you know one of the things that you know, one of the quotes that, you know, either Buffett or Munger, I think Buffett said was, you know, I'm a better investor because I'm a businessman and a better businessman because I'm an investor. I think that really resonated with me. So, you know, after after 10 years or, or close to a decade, you know, working with Invest Corp in, in private equity, where I really just grew up, I, I joined as a, you know, associate. I, I went through then with the first fund, we raised a second fund, and we raised a third fund, and invested it. I had a um, decision to make, I think, where, where I wanted to take my career. And, you know, while I, I think investing allows you to dive into the next layer, especially private equity investing, because you're working very closely with, uh, with company executives, you're, you, you have an influence on, you know, you know trying to you know, create value through, through active management and through operational change. Um, you, you know, there, there's still a level deeper, um, you know, really becoming a businessman. And so in, in 2014, I, you know, we had finished investing, uh, you know, our third fund, it, it was, you know, in very, very good shape. And I, I decided and I had an opportunity to start a company with some, some of my friends, um, who are, who are internet entrepreneurs. And, uh, we ended up building a business, uh, and launching a business. Um, it was just sort of opportune timing around. The, the launch of the Affordable Care Act uh, slash you know, Obamacare. Uh, so we, we built a business around uh, healthcare.com domain um, that was really about making healthcare easier to understand and purchase for, for consumers, which was really this, you know, the, the view was that over the long term, you know, American healthcare, which is very much an employer-based system, was, was moving towards more of a consumer decision. And that would make, create roles and, 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 uh, 
for companies that could help consumers um, learn about the, the very, very complex healthcare industry and, you know, for, for a generation or for a country that frankly does not know how to buy, buy health insurance. Um, and and I, I think it was, a, you know, it was, it was part of this move deeper into understanding how to, how to launch a business, how to, how to raise money, how to build something uh, from nothing. Uh, and, you know, subsequent to, you know, healthcare, I mean, my, my partners really, really grew that business um, over time. I, I actually ended up taking a sabbatical and, and going out to Taiwan, which was the first time I spent a lot of time in Taiwan in 2014 and 15. Um, but since then, I've been really in this mode of, you know, investing um, and getting involved in, in projects that, that I invest in, uh, you know, actively or, uh, and and I've, I've, I've been involved in um, companies, you know, from blockchain to ed tech to, to, to internet companies. So, and I have a few in the works right now. Great. Hey, when we get off this uh, podcast, I got to hit you up to see if there are any uh, client, potential clients of uh, superfocus.ai uh, that you can intro me to. So probably some good customer support or other uh, maybe HR related or healthcare related stuff that uh, we can deploy our technology in. Yeah, definitely. So let's turn to, um, you know, you're writing about China, the development of China. You, you've obviously been a, an observer of an analyst of developments there for some time. I'm actually reminded of uh, a blog post put, I made a long time ago, some writing of Charlie Munger's where I think he gave a talk somewhere and he he talked about how he, he he liked economists, but he was a little bit disappointed in the limitations of where they would take their analysis. And very mm -hmm. early on, he pointed out that uh, there was this kind of problem that the U.S. was going to help China industrialize and advance technologically. But at the end of it, the U.S. might end up with a very formidable competitor and it could, could end up being like a, a real problem uh, for the United States. And he said he, he talked to so many, he talked to many, many academic economists about this uh, issue. And most of them would just not go beyond this issue of gains from trade um, and, uh, you know, uh, Ricardo and things like this. And, and he was very disappointed with that and uh, wrote, wrote a long talk, actually, which uh, I, I put on my blog a long time ago. And he, he was very insightful because what he predicted more or less came true. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, um, I mean, I think some of the issues with economists are maybe that they don't, uh, Maybe maybe there's less of a multidisciplinary approach to yep. you know for them it's a world of numbers and theories and and I, I think with China it's just it's just too big and too complicated to to boil down to to just a set of metrics especially high level metrics yeah in the same way that I think you you could be an economist and have some kind of very theoretical notions about how markets work and economies develop but develop but maybe you've never operated a business so you lack a certain amount of common sense about how these things really go. In the same way, you have people who maybe are see some numbers related to China, but maybe they don't speak the language. Maybe they have some slight ideological bias or cultural bias. And I just see people going, especially today, uh, going way off the rails in terms of their perception of what's happening there or what will happen there in the next decade. Um, maybe you want to comment on that. I mean, I... I this goes back to the comment I made earlier, Steve, about how when I went out to Hong Kong, I, I just, the world looks at things in a very different place. If you grew up in Hong Kong, if you grew up in Asia, you grew up in Thailand, I mean, your, your experience was completely different. And I, I think Americans sometimes take it for granted. Um, they just assume, and, and this was especially like in the late 90s, uh, sort of the post, you know, post communist, you know, glow of that era. There was, there was a bit of a triumphal, triumphalism about, the, the American way and, and how things should be. Um, but not everybody thinks like that. And I, so I already noticed it, you know, just going out there and, and just being away from, uh, you know, being surrounded by the same, you know, messages and, and sort of the same group thing. Um, and just seeing, you know, putting yourself in somebody else's shoes and, and seeing things a little bit differently. Um, and so I would, you know, I would, I would still obviously keep in, you know, read, read articles. You know, we had a Bloomberg terminal and you'd, you'd read all these articles and, a lot of times I would feel there is definitely this gap in, you know, what I'm seeing, you know, on the ground. And, and, and this was the early 2000s. And this was, you know, I think, I think, um, you know, there's books about the collapse of China. And like, I think, you know, the, the, the 
SOE restructuring in the 80s with a heavily indebted banking system and how that would lead to collapse. And, and you know, I wasn't seeing it. I was, I was seeing something different. So there was already a gap then. And I would say that it's just grown since then because I, I think as China has caught up, um, I mean, I think before it was, it was, so, uh, it was so far developmentally below uh, the rich world, the OECD, the United States, that it was it was actually a very good partner. I mean, China had all this labor; they needed jobs, and you know, rich countries would you know love to uh, buy goods cheaper and and keep inflation down. And so it was actually a really good good uh, it was it was a really good relationship. But as as China has gotten closer, we've seen the the, the geopolitical tensions rise. I think that's added another element that has, if anything, just widened um, the gulf between understanding of China and uh, you know what's actually happening on the ground over there. At least, at least between the, the you know the mainstream media or the Western media and and mm-hmm. and what I think is is more of like happening and more real on the ground. I think, you know, going back to Mung, the way Munger thought about it or the way that he, he juxtaposed the economists' opinions of that era to himself was that, okay, you have this Ricardian complementarity that you just mentioned, like, oh, we'll do the high-tech stuff in the States. We'll let these guys do the, the low-tech, ugly manufacturing stuff. It'll keep, it, it's, it's deflationary. It's great, great for American consumers. But what Munger said is, well, eventually they catch up and they're going to be competing at the high end. And how are you going to like them apples? And of course, right. the ability to compete at the high end is also going to feed into their own defense industries and military capabilities. And also the, the fact that they can now fund very large military uh, expansion. So we, we've reached that era. Now, you would think that if I were a national security guy or a U.S. economist, and I was just trying to help thinking only in the interests of my country, I would need to have a realistic view of what's happening over there in order to plan, you know, like, are these hypersonic missiles for real? Can they target them? Can they build batteries better than, should we just give that up to them? Or can we afford to give that up to them? But to, underneath all that, there has to be a level of deep understanding and realism. Otherwise, there's no, there's no limit to the amount of mistakes that our policy people can make. And I just, it kills me every time I, I you know, I read foreign affairs or the economist, or I just feel these people are just very, very strongly miscalibrated about what's happening in China. Yeah, and I think to a certain extent, there was this uh, belief that you know, because of you know, China's, China just has a very different system. Uh, and, and there was almost sort of implicit in that, that it was a system that wouldn't scale or it would eventually. I mean, I think people still thought about China as just a delayed Soviet Union back then. Um, and that eventually it would, you know, the, the inefficiencies of its system would catch up to it. Um, and I think we still see that. I think there is this notion also that Chinese people could only copy um, and that they, they couldn't, you know, innovate. Um, and, and so I, I think there's a lot of, I don't, I don't know if we, we should call it, we call it bias or there, there's just some preconceived notions. And so I think the, I think we've been constantly surprised at how quickly they've developed as a result. Um, that, you know, actually in maybe the process of reverse engineering or copying, you actually develop underlying skill sets that actually take you forward. Um, I think one of the first industries I saw that with, I mentioned earlier, we were, we were investing in, in telecom equipment. So in, in, in the U.S., we, we invested in a software company based in Texas. And so, you know, at, at the meetings, we, we started talking about this little company out in China called Huawei. And, and I, think, I, think, I think you could already feel... The sort of I think the telecom was one of the first uh, front lines of the, the national security concern, and you already felt back then. This was like in two thousand five, two thousand six, that they were already concerned about Huawei. But there's also this feeling of well, they're just copying. They they, they copied that Cisco code in two thousand and three, and um, they're, they're just not going to be able to to uh, to catch up. And and what we we saw through the next fifteen years was not only did they catch up, they actually you know, in 3G, they were they were late to 3G, so they they were behind in 3G. They sort of caught up with 4G and with 5G. They've just you know they've uh, they've taken the lead, and um, so and now that now has happened with solar, it's happened with with EV with electric vehicles. 
um, it's potentially happening with chips. So, you know, I think we're, we're constantly surprised that uh, they continue to, you know, break through and, and innovate and develop. Um, and it's not because of the, you know, they were like, you know, we weren't the reason. I mean, I think, I think it, it was a beneficial relationship. It was a symbiotic relationship for a long time. Um, but at the same time, it was also a lot of their own hard work and, and, and nuts and bolts um, developing and getting educated and learning on the job and just learning by doing. And I think one of the things that I, I think, you know, Americans need to understand is that, that Chinese policymakers um, have long just advocated taking on work because they realize that you actually learn through, through, through modern work. You learn on the job, you learn how to, you know, be a citizen, you learn how to, you know, you learn new skill sets. And, and those are, those are spillover benefits to the, the, you know, what the economists might focus on, which is just the trade flows. There's actually the human capital aspect that's building up as, as an intangible asset that is significant, hard to measure, uh, but significant. Um, and, and that's actually what, what, what is probably the most important thing uh, that drives, you know, this, this long-term s- sustainable growth that we've seen. Yeah. I, I don't want to knock economists too much, although I, you know, as a hobby, I sort of do that, but, 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 but not only do they generally not understand business, and entrepreneurship and innovation, they also don't really understand technology development. So, so they, these are all blind spots for them. For them, these are just like exogenous things in their models, or they don't really have, a, I think, a deep appreciation of how, how they go. I think one of the contributions to the discourse on this comes from Elon, because Elon, you know, was, he, he really was fighting uphill battle when he pointed out to people that, you know what, inventing the thing is 10 times easier than learning how to manufacture that thing efficiently at scale and at, at low cost. You know, those are two different things. And people always just assume, oh, we'll invent stuff in America and that other low value thing, which is figuring out how to manufacture it effectively and, and cheaply, we'll leave that to these Chinese guys, but that'll never be very valuable. Of course, it wasn't valuable for a long time because they were so desperate for work in China for a long time. They were willing to underprice all of that horrible stuff. But when they're not no longer willing to do it for free or do it on the cheap or just to learn, suddenly you're going to realize, wait, that's, that's the more important part maybe of the value chain rather than the idea like, oh, what if I had a little phone that could fit in my hand? You know, like to turn that into an actual iPhone is, 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 is really quite difficult. And, and Musk now realizes this. And I think my understanding is the Shanghai Gigafactory is probably the like best of his Tesla manufacturing facilities and, and the guy I've heard, oh, well, sorry. I've, yeah, I believe far. the guy who runs the Tesla Gigafactory, a Chinese guy is really secretly the guy who runs like the most important aspects of, you know, the, the building part of Tesla. Yeah, no, I, I think that, that that sort of learning aspect of manufacturing is the part that we forgot about. And I think for, for a while it was okay because we had this mass of manufacturing knowledge in the United States, but manufacturing is a, is a, is a, is a mentor apprentice business. And so when we when we shipped those jobs out to uh, to China, you know we would teach the the factory owners how to you know we would send them with molds we we we'd teach them how to manufacture, and then they would take that inf- that knowledge and pass it down to their workers. But the, the link was broken in in the U.S. We didn't have a, a next generation of young manufacturers that were learning starting as you know, entry level out of high school on the on the factory floor, and so. After 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and this, by the way, didn't start with China. This started with Korea and Taiwan before. Yeah. After 30 to 50, that was really, I think, the, 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 the major, major damage from the hollowing out of our economy was that the, well, the link in terms of manufacturing knowledge and learning was, was broken. And, and it's really, really hard to, to rebuild that from scratch again. Um, and, and not to mention just the knowledge aspect, but just having the these whole ecosystems of supply chains that that really make manufacturing work, um, you know, at scale and, and with efficiency. I mean, that that all went over to Asia as well. So, I think there's there's definitely a lot of uh, there's merit. I, I think we're starting. We, we've realized that. I think as a country, we've realized that. I I don't think we, at least from what I've said, I I don't think we've quite figured out how to recapture that. I think companies like Tesla are. I think what you're alluding to is kind of this reverse 
knowledge flow back from the manufacturing expertise in Asia back to the States. But I don't see that uh, necessarily happening at scale. I mean, even even Tesla itself is having a hard time, you know, getting political support in the United States. And actually what we should be doing is is taking that knowledge that they actually have today and and replicating it with with you know in other sectors and in other other manufacturing endeavors. I, I think it's very hard to recover because you need you need to you know not only have huge investment in the infrastructure uh, to to do advanced manufacturing again, but you need to valorize it. You need to get young people excited to do it, and that still doesn't really exist. Like if you ask like high school kids what they want to do in America, very few of them think like oh, I want to get into some factory and really learn how to use that CNC machine extremely efficiently and build really complicated shapes. And so how many kids are really thinking about that? So I still think it, no matter how much money the U.S. Congress appropriates for to reinvigorate manufacturing in America, I, I still think we're lacking some key components that we need to really catch up uh, to, to revitalize it here. Yeah, no, I would agree. So, so one of the things you, you, you know, you, I've seen you tweet about is trying to make a more substantive comparison between number one, the size of the U S economy versus the Chinese economy, but also things like GDP per capita, the meaningful income and wealth or standard of living that people have there versus here. All of these are very, all of these things are very complex to tease out. Um, I don't know, maybe you could say a little bit about it for the audience. Yeah, so I, I think that the, the you know everybody often gravitates towards this this comparison between China and the United States, and you know I think it's you know I, I approach this as sort of a, a compare and contrast. I think there are some basic ideas and concepts that where, where the United States and, and China are quite similar. Like you know we're both uh, very large countries. I think large countries can uh, act in a way that's you know differently from small countries. Um, they can they can, uh, you know, be more self-sufficient um, because you know you got to really think of it as a collection of, you know, thirty-one provinces or fifty states. Um, each of them, you know, that could be the size of an average European country. Um, so you really have to think about them as continent-sized economies. Um, I think even culturally, I think I think Chinese and America is actually culturally quite similar. I think Chinese people are actually quite direct. Um, and they're entrepreneurial. Um, they they're 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 hustlers and they, they get things done. I think Americans as well um, take that approach. Uh, but, but I think there's also a lot of things that are, that are different that, you, you know, that are hard, that, that are important to understand uh, because it drives a lot of uh, the, the ways of handling the economy or things like policy. So just, just a few, for example, would be, you know, one is China is just, uh, you know, suffers from the opposite problem as the United States. In the United States, we have, all this land, all these resources, and not enough people. So for the last 300 years, it's been this constant immigration. <laughs> We've been absorbing immigration and creating wealth through, through, through immigration because actually what we need are people. Um, whereas in China, I mean, they've, they've always been the opposite. They've had too many people um, compared to the amount of resources on the ground. And that's why they were poor. Um, and, and, you know, while this is quite obvious, I think people sometimes don't understand what uh what sort of implications that has on things like economic policy and and doing things differently um china has to do things differently china can't you know this goes again back to the sort of you know washington consensus or the triumphalism triumphalism after in the 90s of there's one right way of doing things um and and actually because of some of these different differences actually no you, you can't you know chinese people can't you know, live in houses with lawns and, and, uh, and, and everybody can't have a car. I mean, it's, it's just going to take away from, it, it's just not possible. Um, so I think that's something that, that, that again, is obvious, but uh, people sometimes don't quite link it to, uh, to, to, to their analysis. Um, the other thing is just uh, this level of economic development. Obviously, China was poor for a long time. I think, I think very few Americans understand uh, the level of poverty that uh, Chinese people understand within their lifetime. Um, and, and that has a major cultural effect. It also has an effect on how um, 
you know, uh, people think about consumption and investing. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, really the last generation to really experience the kind of poverty that China had in the 80s and 90s was the greatest generation, dur you know, during the Depression. Um, and so I think, I think sometimes, you know, we know that China was, was poor, but we haven't quite, there's, there's, there's not a visceral understanding of what that poverty means and, and, and how it might change the way that you, that you, that your policies develop. You know, two, two specific implications of that fact that people there in living memory can remember being very poor. And, you know, even just 20 years ago, when you, I, when I were traveling in China, we could see unbelievable levels of poverty, which, you know, largely are gone now. Um. Anybody who lived through that is number one, maybe not going to have the same kinds of expectations about the level of their retirement, right? So these old people in China, they're probably just happy, in my experience, happy just to be around their family, eat a good meal, play checkers with their friends. They're not thinking that good retirement means they get to go on a cruise ship, you know, around the Gulf of Mexico. Or they don't think that way. So so I think there, well, there are like, when you look at the specific numbers of like the demographic challenges that China faces, like how are they going to support these older people? I think the expectations of these older people are, are much lower than people who had grown up in a developed economy their whole lives and now we're about to retire. These are people who grew up in poverty and then now are getting ready to retire. So I think that's something Westerners can't really appreciate. The other one is that the idea that if China hits a rough patch, the government could collapse. Seems very far-fetched to me because most people attribute that vast improvement over the last 20, 30, 40 years to the government. They, they give a lot of credit to the government for that. And so like if they hit a rough patch that lasts even five years, I don't think it's that brittle. I don't think the system is ready to collapse. I think people have a lot of confidence in the system there based on what happened looking backwards over the last say 20 years. And that's another thing I think Westerners don't appreciate. Yeah. You know, one of the, my, my favorite classes from college, I studied computer science and, and finance and information systems in college, but one of that, my favorite classes was actually demographics, sociology class. And, and one of the things I learned was about demographic cohorts. And so, you know, I, I think that's proven helpful because if, if you really think about it, all the, all the old people right now in China, I mean, 85% of them were farmers. Yep. And, and that's going to shape the way that they think about, to your point, retirement. It's also going to shape what, how, how they feel about how they consume and what they purchase. They're, they're just not going to be going out there and splurging, to your point. Um, they want a house. They want to be around family. They want to take care of their kids. I mean, it, it's very uh, it's very simple. Um, and uh, and so I, th I think, again, I think because I think oftentimes Americans don't don't understand that background. I mean, chi China, you know, is is... It's just such a big place that, I, I mean, I think a, a, a lot of the problems with understanding China are just people don't have time to to break it down to the next level, like break it down by region yeah. or break it down by, you know, uh, social, uh, socioeconomic class or break it down by, uh, you know, blue collar versus white collar. But I, I think you need to break down. If you really want to understand China, you can't look at it as, you can't look at GDP. You have to, you know, you have to break it down by sector. Um, you, you can't look at, uh, you know, consumption versus investment. Again, you have to break it down by sector, by industry. So it, it does require work and it requires thinking along, uh, you know, at a deeper level um, of, of a country that's 1.4 billion people. So um, I, I think the biggest problem is just people think the 99% of people look at China and see it as a monolith. They have one picture, one person, one characterization of China. They they can't really go deeper than that, or it's very very difficult to to go deeper. Let me let me throw out some sort of two different ways to look at China by numbers, and I'll throw out the numbers that you could quote to make it seem like wow, this Chinese economy is already qualitatively bigger than the U.S. economy. Whereas another set of figures I could throw out that suggests like oh, China China is still way behind the U.S. And so you see these dueling kind of worldviews all the time on Twitter, and I see you sometimes uh, engaging in this. So, so we could say, oh, purchasing power parity adjusted, their economy is already like kind of a third bigger than the United States. And you might say, well, uh, well, what, what, okay, what context do you care about this? Well, maybe you care about it in terms of what they, how much they can build up their military. Maybe that's the right metric since the expenditures are domestic that they have to make 
in order to build up their military, the labor to build a tank or a ship or, or a missile is, is local. And so the PPP numbers are right one. And if so, their, if their PPP uh, GDP, total GDP is a lot bigger than the US, then that means they can produce a lot more stuff uh, from a military perspective. From the viewpoint of Joe Economist, though, if I divide their GDP by the population, the average income is still probably, what, a third or a fourth of, depending on whether you use PPP or exchange rates, um, you know, only it, 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 somebody who's an average person in China looks like they're desperately, well, pretty poor by U.S. standards or in poverty. And then someone else can come back and say, yeah, but if you look at that person's life, they have an air-conditioned apartment, they ride the metro, they have a laptop, they have a cell phone, you know, their cell phone bandwidth is faster than yours. Um, so it, it becomes extremely tough to uh, to make these comparisons. You could also look at, for example, the amount of electricity generated and consumed in countries, and and there, like China, just dwarfs the United States. So, so talk talk a little bit about the difficulty in in making these comparisons between the two economies. Yeah, I mean, you know, my my view is that well, well, first of all, I think in China, I think we have to you know, on, a, on a per capita basis. I mean, there, there's 1.4 billion people, so. Um, even though, even if China is, you know, yeah, I think I think the numbers are China's manufacturing value at is thirty percent, and the U.S. is eighteen or nineteen percent. I think on a per capita basis, the U.S. is still actually manufacturing more um, yep. in terms of value. Yep. Um, so, but you know, I think adjusting it purely based on the the spot exchange rate is also under counting the amount of production in China. I think there's there's, so, so I think that the answer is actually closer to the, you know, purchasing power adjusted parity. But even then, there's, there's, uh, you know, a lot of issues. Uh, you know, one of the issues that I've been studying is actually uh, just the way that GDP itself is calculated. Um, you know, I think there's, there's national or global standards uh, on how to calculate GDP, but uh, countries have a lot of leeway to interpret um, those standards and. There's also older standards and newer standards, and and for a long time, China was actually on an, on an older standards. Uh, I think the, the 2008 version of of SNA, and so under the older uh, un, under the older versions, um, even if there were true economic activity, sometimes it wouldn't be counted. I think services um, was one of the uh, components of GDP that was uh, revised in in, in the latest uh, accounting update. Uh, and China has slowly adopted it, but it's it's been taking time. And and just even more fundamentally, I think China came from a communist history past, and their measurement systems. I mean, we we have to sometimes think about. I mean, there's lo- there's always a lot of questions about, you know, the numbers coming out of China, and are they being faked or are they fraudulent? And you know, I the way I look at it, I I see a bunch of bean counters, and bean counters have their their you know good traits and their bad traits. They're they're you know, they 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 sometimes make mistakes. They sometimes count the wrong things. Sometimes the series, you know, the way that GDP is put together involves merging, you know, dozens and dozens of different statistical series and, and triangulating. And and so, you know, I, I I just look at it as you know a this big approximation exercise anyway. Um, and and of course, I think there's there's some you know political or you know propaganda elements to it. But I think that usually has mainly to do with like the top level numbers. I mean, no, the average person is not going to care about, you know, steel production per capita or anything like that. They're going to compare it with that 5% GDP number. And so I, I think we've seen some uh, evidence of smoothing, whether it's real world smoothing by, you know, doing, using sort of, you know, uh, stimulus and, and taking off stimulus or actual, you know, playing with the, for example, playing with the GDP deflator, the, the uh, inflation assumption to make it look smoother than it really is. Um, but you know, are are they? Is there wholesale, uh, you know, fraudulent or faking of, of number? No, I, I see I see bean counters, uh, counting up numbers. Um, you know, sometimes imperfectly and, and often having to revise. Um, you know, and it's really interesting. I, I, I've, you know, that that was one of the that was one of the things where if you if you're sort of a, you know, you know, a China macro tourist, and you know, I think one of the things that you pick up on early is, well, you can't trust the numbers coming out of China. Um, and, you know, you know, I, I picked up on that 
theme as well. But, you know, I think for me, my approach was to dig into the numbers um, and to look into the numbers. And, and I think we'll talk about later about where, you know, picking a very specific sector like high speed rail, uh, you know, a lot of what I, what I learned about, you know, how, you know, Chinese bean counters count things was by looking at the detailed numbers coming out of this one sector and seeing how they triangulated with uh, the financials and, and, and how it rolled up into the, into the rest of the economy. And very importantly, how it sometimes was very, very different from uh, what you would hear about, you know, in the West and, 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 and in media that actually did take the time to look at the numbers and, and try to reconcile them for yourself from, from a really detailed level. Um, and so this, this actually, this actually, I think, plays on um, this idea of, you know, going deeper and deeper. And so we started with sort of, you know, global, then we, we talked about China. Then I think you peel back that onion and you get down to a sector. And, you, you, and, and I think it's been, it's been really, just like with my professional career where I started Big Picture and went down to, you know, building companies. Uh, in the same way, I think my, my approach to understanding China has been to have form a macro view, but then validate it by, by going deeper and deeper. And actually getting a much uh, more, less abstract understanding of the numbers and actually getting a real, you know, physical or tangible uh, understanding of what those numbers are in the case of high-speed rail. Yeah, so we're, we're an hour in, so I would just say, let's let's jump into high-speed rail, which is something I know you've analyzed in depth. And it's a, it's a huge symbolic thing in China that, um, you know, it's a, it's a symbol of like where they're really world leading, both in technology and the, the scale of deployment. And, and and for again, like people who've never been to China and ridden on their rail system, it's it's incredibly impressive when you when you get on one of these trains. Before we do that, let me just comment that I totally agree with you that starting with this macro view, you know, top line numbers, but then you have to drill down to really get to the reality. I would offer another example, which is the scientific and technological competitive competitiveness of say China versus the U.S. There's the top line numbers like patents, um, number of college graduates with a certain type of degree, um, you know, uh, number of uh, innovations in a particular vertical. Those could be misleading. What you really need to do is, and what, what someone like me who's a professor of, of physics is, is in a good position to do, is you really see how good people are. Like you see the Chinese kids who went to Chinese universities and now they're in graduate programs in the US and they are among the best grad students that we have. No department here could survive without those students uh, across not just physics, but physical sciences and engineering, computer science. But then you go there and you actually talk to the professors who you know, are pretty young now. I mean, they're much younger than I am, the new professors there. And you see like, is this guy up to speed? Is this guy really at a world-class level in his training and research and what his team is doing in their lab? And the answer is yes. So the, the basic thing, like you can have all this debate on the internet, like, oh, these are bullshit patents. These are not useful or they don't really know what they're doing. Well, you know what? Talk to any professor of engineering or physics or chemistry in the United States who has traveled to China recently and looked at what they're doing there. And they will tell you they pretty much caught up. They might not be exactly caught up. The US might still be ahead, but, you know, largely they've caught up and it's qualitatively different situation than even 10 years ago. So that, that's my in-depth um, report on something that I've seen firsthand. Let's switch over to high-speed rail. So oh, um, there, there are two things about it. Like I often hear the claim that this is just some huge sink of resources in China. It can't really be justified. It's a waste of money. It's all for show. And eventually they're going to run out of money and this whole system's going to collapse. Uh, maybe, maybe we can just start with that and, and then you can, you can take it wherever you want to go after that. Yeah, well, let me let me just you know preface this by saying I've I've always just been interested in, in public infrastructure and trains. Uh, you know, when I when I first moved to Hong Kong and I you know the first time I stepped into the MTR, I was I was out. I mean, I was like, oh my my cell phone works, you know, while while the train is running, and that was in two thousand and one. Uh, now I, I rode to you, but now I think can't you get on the MTR and then like literally like go all the way to Beijing or something? You can. You, you have to transfer to a train, but then you can go like all the way up to Beijing now, I think on high-speed train or something. Yeah, well, on, on the high-speed train, but, but, uh, but um, as well, yeah, I think you can, you can take it from, uh, I, mean, I, used to, I used to joke that you could get from the, 
the, the Hong Kong airport to my office without ever stepping outside. You could just, you know, get on the train and go on the airport express and then take a series of uh, steps, covered steps, and, and go through buildings and eventually get to my office at, at the Chong Kong Center in, in downtown Hong Kong. But um, yeah, and, and, you know, I wrote the, I wrote the, uh, the Shanghai Maglev in 2005. My, my first experience on the, the high speed rail was in, actually in Taiwan in 2007. And I used to actually keep this little blog. Uh, I think it was on Zanga and I wrote, it was actually one of my first like non, like more serious posts. And I, I posted about how, you know, for the, the cost of the war on terror, we could have built, you know, you know, at, at Taiwan rates of, you know, dollars per, per kilometer, we could have built our own little high speed rail network by now, uh, back in, back in the mid two thousands. But, um, you know, and so of course, when China started to, uh, to build, uh, it's, it's network, you know, I'll be honest, I was actually pretty skeptical. I was, First of all, I was, I was, you know, I thought China was developing. I didn't think it was developing that fast, um, that it could actually get it done. And, and I was frankly very, very skeptical about it. Um, and so w when the first lines opened, and again, I, you know, I, I, you know, the first time I actually wrote it was in 2016. So, you know, when the first lines opened in 2007, 2008, you hear about it, but it's, it doesn't really register with you. You're, you know, you, um, and then, and then the when the when the crash happened in 2011, I think that was, you know, there was this already this uh, theme that you touched upon about how China has this investment heavy model, and that high speed rail was just another part of that, you know, another another example. It's not the most egregious example of that that over investment model. And I, I think that narrative was also tied to. Some of these early the earlier themes that we talked about, like how uh, the state uh, or state-owned you know companies are just can't compete with private sector companies on allocating capital. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that sort of perpetuated or, or propagated into this this idea that of, well, of course, high-speed rail must be inefficient. They're spending you know hundreds of billions of dollars. There, there's no you know there's no process in place. They're just they're shooting in the dark. Um, and and frankly, I think that was how I felt about it as well uh, for the for the first few years. Um, you know, I, I was open though. I was open. I had an open mind that hey, maybe the the Chinese could actually uh, get this right. And I was open. And I saw the merits in it. You know, China is again, it's it, it's a country that can't have put a car in every, every person's driveway, or people, actually, everybody doesn't have a driveway <laughs> put a car in, and and so they have to rely on public transportation more. Um, I, I understood the the positive uh, social externalities of rail. Uh, we didn't have to, you know, burn gasoline, uh, less pollution, um, and uh, you know, just not being stuck in traffic and, and being congested. But what I really didn't understand for a long time was actually a way to think about the the numbers um, of high speed rail. And so, you know, I started. Kind of borrowing from my my investment experience, started just drilling down um, into the numbers, um, and it, it, so it turns out China Railway, which uh, owns or controls the entire passenger network as well as the freight network, is one of the largest bond issuers, if not the largest bond issuer in a public bond issuer in China, which means that they have public financials. Now, this was this happened because the Ministry of Transport. It used to be part of the Ministry of Transport. It was the last major ministry to corporatize. Um, this and this followed the you know the, the Wenzhou um, crack, as well as the corruption allegations in the early two thousand two thousand tens. And they created China China Railway out of this. They 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 listed and and financed it with mostly with bonds and uh, at the project level secured loans from the banks. And what that meant was starting in two thousand thirteen, China Railway started. Uh, uh, you know, publicly uh, issuing numbers that you could actually start tracking. Now, I didn't realize this uh, until actually several years later. Um, but, you know, you started seeing some numbers come out. Um, and, and I think this is where a little bit of, you know, having a, a financial back background helps. Uh, so being able to read like an income statement and a balance sheet and when you're deb debating things like uh, debt uh, and thinking about things like credit capacity. I mean, it, it helps to understand Financials. Um, the other thing is, all these numbers are Chinese, um, so you know you can you can get it translated, but like nobody 
who has a passing interest in high-speed rail and doesn't speak Chinese is going to translate it. So, you know, I ended up, you know, going through the the, the Chinese language financials and um, and also the operating data that they received. And slowly this, this picture began to emerge. Uh, that was a little bit different, I think, from the the more popular narrative at the time, which was that um, it was highly inefficient. Um, they had built uh, they had built uh, routes in places where people didn't live, and so you know ridership was very very low, which is you know the, the worst thing that you, you can do for uh, for high fixed upfront fixed cost projects is you know, you know having low utilization. Um, there was this idea that um, it was debt funded uh, investment that was done because you know, the, the politicians wanted GDP growth and not because there were actually real reasons for it. Um, and by digging into the numbers, you know, I slowly uh, peeled that onion and, uh, you know, realized that a lot of these things weren't actually true. Number one, ridership um, and utilization was actually not that bad, um, even in the early years. Um, it actually uh, bottomed out around 2015 and 2016. Um, after the, the first phase uh, lines had had basically just uh, after the second phase construction lines had uh, had opened, and and then it started to slowly improve in 2017 to 2019. Um, you know, I, I looked at the the debt numbers, I looked at the, the the income statement, and I realized that actually, you know, the the company could support uh, the debt load based on. Um, not only the ticket revenue. So a lot of people were just looking at the ticket revenue. They didn't understand that uh, part of the real model. And, and you would understand this if you had looked at like MTR Corporation in Hong Kong. Part of the real model is that you generate all this foot traffic and that's really a real estate play. So actually you have to look at it as a combination of a, of a, of a transportation network, but also a real estate play. So all the, the, the commercial leases that they rent out to you know, catering and restaurants at the train stations the catering on the trains, the advertisements on the train. This is this is all part of that economic model. People weren't uh, there was a, there was a famous uh, you know Chinese economist who was critical of high speed rail, and, he, and part of his analysis did not take into account uh, the sort of real estate business portion of uh, the of China rail. Yeah. Now, just to, sorry to interrupt, but just a point for Americans. I, maybe Europeans would understand this better. But if you're in Taiwan or Hong Kong or Korea or Japan or China, some of the most valuable real estate is where there's a metro station or a high-speed rail station because there's guaranteed flow of people there. And sometimes you'll see the most luxurious, beautiful malls, apartment complexes, um, office buildings just built around that structure. Actually, even in Bangkok now, you see that. So um, yeah. that's something to be uh, to take into account because- the rail company is creating that value by putting the station there. So that's part of the investment. And then that creates this complex, uh, which then turns out to be super valuable in real estate terms. No, absolutely. I mean, I, I think you can't really run a profitable, uh, you know, public transportation business without thinking about retail and, and monetizing um, all of that uh, foot traffic that you generate. Um, you know, some of some of the best business models uh, are actually hidden real estate businesses like Asian food markets. You know, they they don't make money on the food; they they make money by renting out all the stores based on the traffic that they generate. So, I mean, you know, I think I think so. I think you need to understand kind of understand the business model of transport, and and um, and then I think secondly, I think the other piece was um, just all the stuff that's not measured, uh, the, the positive externalities. I mean. It had, these have real value, but um, it, it's hard to measure. And I, th I think this is where this discussion of whether a private sector approach versus a public sector approach uh, becomes really, really interesting. Because you know, you know, the private sector approach would be to effectively align the the, the project um, sponsor as an equity hold. But if you think about public transport, it's not just about the equity owners. It's, it's about the travelers it's about the the local communities and and sort of the spillover effects um a if you're an equity holder is your incentive your incentive is going to be to maximize uh, to maximize you know ticket prices to you know some some optimal level that may not be actually optimal for society 
Um, whereas, uh, you know, I think China Railway being a state-owned enterprise, uh, they're, they actually don't try to optimize for return on equity. They actually try to keep prices low. Yeah, it's ridiculously, so there, there's a, there's a, it's ridiculously cheap to ride this system, for, at least from a Western perspective. And, and actually increasingly from a Chinese perspective. So, you know, one of the things you'll notice with, with um, you know, high-speed rail tickets is that prices don't really go up. So when the, when the Beijing Tianjin line opened in 2009, it was, I think it was 58 yuan to take that, you know, one hour or 45 minute trip. Um, it's still, actually, I think some fares I saw were still actually cheaper than that, even though inflation or just the fact that household incomes have risen three to four X since 2009. So it's become three to four times more affordable uh, to take that ride. And, and that's may not be something that happens if, if this were, um, if the decision makers, the people making decisions on tariffs were the equity holder. At, at, um, at this stage, though, when, you, when you're talking about the externalities, social benefits from the uh, transportation infrastructure to average people, it, it gets pretty complicated. Like in the U.S., we built out the freeway system after World War II and spent unbelievable amounts of money on that. And some environmentalists would say, you know, to the detriment of our cities and you know, all this stuff, walkability, all that stuff. But of course, it's an incredibly complex question. Like, was it worth it? Was that a good thing to build all these freeways? Of course, it had very strong second order effects on economic development of the whole country, right? So I think very, I think for me, very tough to really just get a, get the whole thing. Like, I don't even know, like, do I, what's my opinion about all the freeway building we did in the US? Is it like net good or net bad? I'm, I'm not even sure. But in it, from a narrow perspective though, I guess, I think you're saying that the rail system, say the high-speed rail system in China, is not going to need huge continued government subsidies forever, will it? Uh, what, is, what do the numbers say about that? Well, to, to grow the, 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 the network, the, the company saw it's, you know, take on debt to build out new assets. Uh, but the existing network is, is largely self-sufficient at this yeah, point. Okay. Um, like I said, they're they're not maximizing revenue. They could actually increase tariffs and probably grow revenue, but they actually don't try to maximize uh, revenue. Um, they they basically target paying off all the the debt that they've issued to support the network at like three to four percent interest rate, yep. um, and they set set tariffs at that level, and and that's it. Um, so they're not looking to generate actually a return on equity. I think the return on equity for them is basically the consumer surplus and all the, these positive externalities that accrue to you know, other sectors and, you know, you know, you know, other uh, into the households in the form of a higher quality. Of and life. for the exist for the existing networks, uh, ignoring like building it out further, but for the existing network, future maintenance and keeping the technology up to date, does that look like it's going to be like a problem where they have to get a chunk of cash from government to do that or? No, I mean, they, the, the, the maintenance costs are, are well understood. There were, there was this really great World Bank report. World Bank financed uh, four of the, Phase one lines back in from 2008 to 2014. So they had a they had deep insight uh, into how these uh, these projects were run. And by the way, that gave me a lot of uh, confidence that because you had a you had a sort of external independent uh, party looking at these projects that you know that gave me a lot of confidence that the numbers weren't being made up, right? Because uh, they have access to all the detail project implement. They were a lender uh, to some of these projects. Um, so, but the World Bank came out with a report that summarized their findings uh, about China's high-speed rail experience uh, in 2019. And they, they talk about maintenance. One of, one, of, one of the many things they talk about is that maintenance costs are well understood. I think for every, every kilometer of rail, it costs, I think, something like between 1.8 to 2.3 million RMB per year to just maintain the line so that it stays in tip-top shape. Um, so those costs are built into the, mm. into the, you know, the, the cost recovery structure, uh, the, the, into the operating expense structure that they use to set tariffs. Those costs don't necessarily, uh, they, they don't go up, they, they go up probably with the cost of labor. Mm -hmm. um, though, you know, you can also argue, I think they've automated a lot of the maintenance by using, they've created all this, and, and this is, this is another really interesting thing. They created all this specialized equipment that was that was geared towards high speed rail, um, that was specialized for high speed rail. You've seen this happen in, in a bunch of other industries as well. That's unique to uh, that sector. 
So they have automated maintenance equipment that will run along the line, make sure that they're, you know, it's smooth and that the metal isn't worn out. And, and they're, they're now talking about using big data and machine learning. And I, I'm not sure if it's really AI, but they're using big data to really understand, yeah. um, you know, preemptively how you can, you can maintain these lines. So th those costs are all built into the, into the OPEX structure. Uh, and covered by by tariffs and by this this ancillary right uh, non transport revenue. So, just to summarize it, I think you're saying that having looked into the details, there's enough transparency that you can conclude that this is actually a healthy system. It, it's not a what was a, what, what was the word though not pink not white elephant but uh, gray rhino or there were there's some okay, right. yeah there were some negative. Uh, ways that people had to refer to this whole thing as just a huge sink of resources for the Chinese government and people. But you're, I think you're, you're confident that's actually not the case. Yeah. And you know, what really validated for me, Steve, was, you know, during, during the pandemic, when people were traveling, the, the financials didn't look great. They were basically running, running at a loss, you know, knowing that eventually they would, they would come out of the pandemic. But what really validated for me was you saw a lot of momentum going from 2016 to 2019 in sort of the increase in ridership. And then you sort of had this dip. What validated for me was coming out of the pandemic, ridership shot back up to, it's not quite on trend yet, but it's, it's back up to, you know, I think 92 or 93% of what, what would have been the trend without the pandemic. And, you know, you're talking, I mean, China Railway is, is a company that is generating something like $200 billion of revenue and $70 billion of EBITDA. I mean, th these are, so I mean, it's sort of there's there's this cognitive dissonance when I when I hear about uh, this thing being a disaster, like a financial disaster. When when I see numbers like that, um, you know, in the financials that are that you know millions of public bond investors rely on uh, to get their 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 dividend payments or their interest payments. That's great. That's a great story, Ed. And we'll we'll put some links into you, the, your analysis is available not just on Twitter, but it's on some. Is it on a blog or somewhere that people can find? Well, on Substack, yeah. Okay, put some links into that. Um, we, so we, we're, we've been on for almost an hour and 20 minutes. Um, I thought maybe we could close out by just talking about the... Let me throw out a hypothesis and then you, you can give me a reaction to it. So my view of the problems that they're having in the Chinese economy right now, one could think of multiple drivers. So so one is, is maybe she imposing some increased centralization and less business-friendly environment on what's happening in China. Number two is still coming out of COVID to some extent. And number three is, to me, maybe the most important one, a property bubble that everybody has known about for 10 years or more. They knew they were going to have to pop it. The government moved to pop it and is deliberately shifting investment so that growth in their economy is not coming from investment mainly in property and related infrastructure, but in investment in advanced technology and advanced manufacturing. And, and that, to me, if that third thing is the dominant component of the malaise that they're feeling right now, it, it, it's a gamble because maybe it's not going to work out. But on the other hand, it's, it's, it's a very clear strategy that they have, that they're going to endure whatever it is, five years or maybe even 10 years to get out of this property bubble problem that they had. And, but at the end of it, maybe they'll be even higher on the value add chain in manufacturing and high technology. Um, maybe you can just react to what I just said. Yeah, no. And, and so just, you know, I think that, you know, having watched and, and participated in looking at the Chinese economy over the last 20 years or more, I, I've seen the economy actually go through multiple shifts. Um, driven by some of the, the factors that we talked about before, like demographic change and just the natural process of moving up and climbing the, the value chain uh, in terms of knowledge and skills and human capital. Um, so to me, the, the property and infrastructure investment of, you know, really in, in the, sort of starting in the early 2000s when they, they reformed property reform and you could actually own a home for the first time um, and then really accelerating uh, after the GFC. I mean, to me, property and infrastructure were necessary evils because this, this is pretty low on the on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Like you need shelter yeah. and you need a place to live, especially in a country of 1.4 billion and where, where there's not a lot of land. And so you're going to have to build up. 
there's just no way of escaping that. Um, so the, the, yeah, I'm actually, I think on the more, you know, optimistic side that it wasn't actually as big of a bubble um, as people thought. I think there is definitely some uh, malinvestment, but I think that the, the issue of malinvestment was more one of distribution, not one of aggregate malinvestment. Um, I think if, you know, if you understand the way that the the land finance mechanism work, it, it's sort of like a, you know, it's like, it's like a one, one size fits all financing approach that may work well in Shanghai, but doesn't work well in, in Guizhou. So you end up with certain areas like the tier one cities where there's actually an undersupply of housing because they're dealing with not, they don't want too many people to move there because they have to provide social services. And then you, you have other places like in Guizhou where there's actually an oversupply of housing because you have this crude uh, financing mechanism. Um, so to me, it was actually more of a distribution problem because to your earlier point, uh, I think the central government plays that uh, disciplining role um, and they're the ones who stepped in and said, okay, I think it's on, on, in aggregate, we're, we're getting a little bit too, uh, we're building a little bit too much and we have to start deflating that bubble. And it, it was a, it was actually like a 10 year process of trying to deflate that bubble. And so that, that transition to me wasn't, didn't start three years ago. It, it started 10 years ago um, and sort of laying the groundwork. I mean, this is, this is one of the challenges of dealing with an economy of 1.4 billion people is that you can't move the ship that quickly, especially something as big as this. So, um, you know, you know, it's 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 actually I think the degree of difficulty is quite high, um, and so you're never going to get everything right. Um, I think there there's also the other, I think, big picture issue in China of just um, rising inequality. So 12 years ago, 15 years ago, if you talked to people, people, that was one of the biggest issues on people's minds. They're like, well, you know, it, you know, the, the economy is growing fast and it, you know, it's dynamic and everything, but you're leaving the inland prof provinces behind. Um, you've got three major regions that are prospering. The rest of the country is being left behind. Social inequality, which was a absolutely a valid issue back 15 years ago, um, it takes sacrifice to to correct social inequality. And I think a lot of the slowdown in growth, I mean, I would even argue that a lot of the infrastructure investment that was sort of spread out peanut butter style across the country was one of the ways uh, that uh, they were actually trying to address poverty um, is by bringing infrastructure into regions that couldn't afford it on their own, which meant, you know, the, the wealthier regions are effectively subsidizing asset and infrastructure development for the poor regions. That to me is a balance social inequality balancing effect. Uh, and so I think the cost of that has been slower growth. Um, so, so I call property and infrastructure a necessary evil because it's fundamentally a very low return on investment type of activity, but it's also really necessary. You need homes and you need infrastructure. Uh, so now, uh, you know, one of the, the issues with turning around this big ship of 1.4 billion souls is uh, you had to make some sacrifices. And I think the, the, the government made, made a conscious choice to uh, have the mass affluent in society eat a lot of the, the pain. Um, over the last three years, they, they cracked down on property, which, you know, people, the people buying second and third homes for speculation were in, were all in that five, you know, upper five to 10%. Um, so they're the ones who are really hurt by, you know, speculating uh, and by, by real estate prices going down, whereas everybody else who bought a home, I mean, they're living in it. It's their one home. For them, it's, it doesn't really matter what the mark-to-market -market is. It's just where they live. Um, so that was one. Um, secondly, I think they've made a conscious effort to make sure that um, particularly the, the blue-collar uh, labor force is fully employed. Uh, I think in, in China, the, you know, the, the, the key uh, stimulus, it's not like a demands, a Western style demands side stimulus where you're just uh, sending, ch cutting checks to people. I think their form of stimulus is to make sure people are employed and, and earning uh, incomes that are growing. And out of that income, they're going to spend more and more and more uh, and, and with, you know, result in rising demand. So I think they've been very focused on making sure that the blue collar labor pool has, and, and the farmers and that you know, in the countryside, that their incomes are, are rising. And so they're, you know, that combined group has actually been 
uh, relatively has done relatively well um, over the last 10 years in terms of their their income, whereas the sort of the mass affluent, they've, they've gotten hit on the capital income side with stocks and with, with real estate, and the, their incomes are actually, I think, uh, rising a little bit below below the, the national average as well. So I think they were they were the casualty in all this. And, and so what we're seeing right now, I think the big question is whether, I mean, people talk about this economic malaise. Um, it's largely with that top five to 10% of the population. And um, I think the bet is that at some point they're going to sort of accept, you know, their losses and, you know, they're, they're going to open up their pocketbooks. I mean, it's not like they've been, their, their income has been going down. I mean, it's just, they're just not rising as quickly as they were before. So I think there has, there, there's been a reset of expectations for the, the you know, sort of the, the mass affluent. Um, we, we've seen that that's, that's fairly evident, you know, I mean, a lot of the people in my circle, I mean, that's who I talk to. And I, I sometimes have to consciously tell myself, this is not all of China. This is the, this is the top five to 10% of China. So this is not necessarily indicative. Um, so I think that is the challenge, but that's, that's sort of a wait and see game. I mean, you can't, you can't control, you know, consumer sentiment. It's, it's one of the things that the, the Chinese government cannot control. They, they, they tend to just try to stick to, the, in terms of policy, things that they can control and, and. Uh, for, for things that they cannot control, they'll make sure that they have policy tools um, available so that, um, you know, if, if consumer sentiment declines even further, can they make up for it with some stimulus? So I, I think that's how we haven't seen a lot of stimulus yet because, and that to me is actually a sign that um, their things are actually going okay, maybe not not gangbusters, um, but that they're, you know, if things do fall off and, and either if there's an exogenous, if, if there's another round of, you know, 60% tariffs, you know, there's, there's an adjustment mechanism there probably with the FX rate. Um, or if consumer sen sentiment improves, well, then you can maybe uh, adjust the other way. Um, and um, so to me, it's, it's sort of a Goldilocks environment. Um, and, and we're going through a transition phase now to the point of, of these resources flowing from the, formerly from the property sector and from sort of old infrastructure into some of the new infrastructure stuff like clean energy, as well as the advanced manufacturing side. And, and that, just, that just takes time. You know, I've been studying a lot. I've been doing a lot of uh, recently on just understanding um, like the electric vehicle you know, industry and capacity. It just, it takes time to, uh, to build up capacity. Um, I think in my latest uh, research, uh, you know, I, I, I sort of have a different view from the mainstream, which is I, I think China is going to is not suffering from EV over capacity. In fact, I think they need to grow EV capacity by 5x over the next 15 years. And uh, and and growing at 5x means installing the equ the equivalent of South Korea's auto manufacturing output every single year from now till 2033. So it's it's not a trivial task. I think it doesn't happen like magically. You can't press a button and it happens. You need to have the people in place. Yep. You need to have the skills and you need to coordinate the entire supply chain. So there's there's a lot to do i think for for the economy there's plenty of stuff to keep it occupied uh for, for the next 10 years but the, the transition is happening um and and i think we just we just need to watch um, how things go wow that's great i i think this is a great place to end we're right at 90 minutes and i, I think i've learned a lot i think the audience has learned a lot from your uh, detailed insights um any last thing you want to say glenn before we uh stop the recording well, no, I, th I think we, we actually ended up covering maybe like one half of the, the outline. Um, so, you know, w w I really enjoyed the experience and, you know, we'd love to you know continue this conversation in the future. Yeah, let's definitely keep in touch.